This is The Philanthropy Show, connecting and inspiring philanthropy. All right, here we are. Welcome to The Philanthropy Show. I'm your host, Luann Saraga Walters. Very exciting for us today because we are here live in Orlando for the 2016 Planet Philanthropy. Planet Philanthropy, that's AFP Florida's annual event, really. And this is uh, kind of a fun session that we have. We've decided to really look at how do marketing and development work together. So this session, this particular breakout session, is about marketing your organization with purpose, with the dollar sign being significant in the word purpose. We don't just want to do marketing for marketing's sake. Everything that we're doing within an organization is to drive that ball right towards the end goal, towards the zone, using a football metaphor, to get us to where we want to be. And that would be our touchdown. Our panelists, our guests on the show today, have a sleuth. I think I added it up, and it's well over 60 years combined total experience in marketing and fundraising. And I'm going to start on my far right with John Hirsch, Marketing and Membership Coordinator at Nonprofits First. John has 10 years in educational philanthropy in the nonprofit sector, but an extensive background in social media and marketing in the for-profit and nonprofit sector as well. Um, and he was also on the planning committee this year for Planet Philanthropy with the caucus. So thanks for being with us. Thank you. Josh, wonderful to have you. He's also got a great bass voice. We love hearing him talk. Then we have Sarah Leonard, who is a CFRA. She has over 25 years in nonprofit fundraising. She's a consultant instructor, a co-instructor of the Fundraising Success Online series with her course, The Complete Development Plan, which I think is how many points? CFRE points? Three CFRE Three credits. Three CFRE credits. She was the former Fund Development Academy well, she developed the Fund Development Academy. Mm -hmm. Basically, you created it at the Nonprofit Leadership Center of Tampa Bay. So it's wonderful to have you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And then Meryl Stewart, who is CEO of Marketing and Business Solutions, the company she founded. She has over 17 years in marketing and fundraising and communications, again, for for-profits and mm -hmm. nonprofits. She is a consultant instructor and also a co-instructor of the Fundraising Success Series online with her course, Creating an Annual Marketing and Communications Plan, which is also worth three CFRE credits. Approved for three CFRE yeah. credits. So we've got some professionals here, some experts who really know what is going on. I also want to give uh, a nod out to our production crew. We have my wife, Sharon Saraga Walters, who is on camera one and audio. Tracy Muir, who is the Assistant Vice President of Donor Services for USF Foundation on camera three. and. Not last, but certainly not least, we have Bryn Warner, CFRE. He's the Senior Director, Resource Development at Suncoast Hospice Foundation, and this year's co-chair of Planet Philanthropy, of this awesome, awesome, amazing. And how do you say the name of this hotel, where we are? The Carib Royale. The Carib Royale, because it looks like Caribe. It's very nice. Love it. Let's get started in our first segment talking about what marketing with purpose means and what that looks like. Now, I touched briefly on wanting to make sure that our marketing and our development are working hand in hand, but who wants to start with that? What does marketing with purpose look like from a fundraising perspective? I've, my background is in small shop fundraising, and I was always the one who had both the hat of director of development as well as director of communications. And I always strongly believe that your left hand needs to know what your right hand is saying, so it really ties in well that if it's not a single person, which ideally it's not one person, you have multiple departments, but you're in such sync that you know, you know, left and right what's happening at all times because your communications person needs to be out there selling your organization and what your fundraiser is out there doing needs to be right in line with what your communications are doing, whether it's out there soliciting a donation or just general programs. And I think an additional to that is that, you know, marketing with purpose is really telling your story. Um, it's really talking about the impact, talking about who you are as a brand and as an organization and integrating that experience, how you impact people or animals or whatever the cause may be, um, and integrating that into your marketing messaging and also your fundraising messaging so that, you know, whatever you're doing from a fundraising standpoint is benefiting from the marketing messaging and vice versa. I want to take a quick survey of the audience and find out how many of you are, like Josh said, both development and marketing hats in one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so about a third in this room. And how many of you have worked at nonprofits or organizations that 
you don't necessarily have the best communication. You wish that you'd had better communication between the marketing and the development teams. Yeah, about half. So I think that's, that's fundamentally what they both just said. We, we really want to gear towards that. So knowing that that's important, it's great to say it, but why? Why is that important? Why is it important for the marketing and the development to be on the same page? You need a consistent voice. Whether it's informal or you're very technical, however you're speaking, it needs to come through in both your you know, written, electronic, social media, it doesn't matter. You need to be able to tell that story consistently from your board member to your volunteer to your solicitations. It all has to speak the same. And I would speak to large nonprofits that have marketing that's not just fundraising. For instance, mm -hmm. a hospital a university, a museum, they have marketing and communications that's meant to attract visitors to a museum or patients to a hospital, but even in those cases it needs to work well with fundraising and development. They may have several different sets of messages to several different audiences, but it needs to be coordinated mm -hmm. and, and focus on the mission. Were you about to say something? <laughs> well, and I think too that, that your donors are part of your audience, so mm -hmm. even if your marketing department is separate from the fundraising department, and it's not one person wearing that hat, um, that the donor audience is looking for specific things to, to be told to them. You know, mm -hmm. they want to know about impact, they want to know about where their money is going and what it's doing. Um, and so marketing, you know, whether you're doing it so through social media or e-communications or whatever the, the channel is, um, all has to be consistent. It's interesting because I think from a development and a marketing perspective, and like Josh, I've been in that position of wearing both hats at the same time, we really have to look at both from that donor's perspective. Mm -hmm. there, are some, there are some huge criteria that we think of in development as far as how we're going to pursue a particular donor, and it's, it kind of goes parallel with marketing, too. Why is it so important to understand your donors' needs or their, their interests or their issues from that marketing perspective? Well, you have to be able to communicate to them. So if a donor is coming in and they're interested in a certain segment of what you're doing or a certain service that you're offering, um, they want to know how, how their involvement is going to further engage or better that part of what it is that you're doing. And the marketing piece should really complement that. You know, the, the marketing is, is the how we do it. Um, the, the messaging has to be you know, cohesive to what your brand is and what your organization represents and how you talk about yourself across audiences. But from a donor's perspective, you have to be able to connect with them on their level as to mm -hmm. what it is that they're interested in and how it is that they see that you're doing the best work with what it is that they're providing you. you know, if a donor makes a gift to the College of Journalism and Communications, you're not going to send an acknowledgment saying thank you for your support of Shantz Hospital. <laughs> it just would not be, and there would obviously be some major issues there internally with the way those, uh, those gifts are being recorded in your database. When you bring up thank you letters and acknowledgments, sometimes we forget that's part of a marketing and communications plan. Oh, and, yeah. and sometimes that's done in a whole separate department or not given much attention at all. It's just somebody hammering out a thank you letter, but that's a huge part of communicating with our donors. You've all just kind of touched on it and I was about to lead into that. So my next question is how do you connect your donors' interests with your organization's purpose? Mm. Hmm. Well, I, I, listen, you have, yeah. to, you have to ask your donors. You have to either listen to them one-on-one -on -one or communicate with them in a larger audience with surveys or, or watch what they respond to. So let me ask it a different way. So maybe the development team knows what those issues mm -hmm. are that they're focusing on and mm -hmm. the marketing team doesn't, or maybe they have different <coughs> goals. How do you merge those two? You want to have a good, clean database. You want to make sure that you have as few hands in it as possible because the more garbage in, the more garbage out you're going to get. So if you have a consistent policy on how you're recording data, how you're recording donor visits, hmm. it'll help from your communications when you're tracking it back over to your development. I also think that it's about just communicating internally. So if you have, um, I've worked with clients where they do have a specific marketing team and a fundraising team and um, both, both sides are going two different directions and the easiest way is to create a comprehensive kind of communications plan so that you've outlined how the organization is communicating across all audiences, including fundraising, 
and how the fundraising group is communicating with their donors and seeing where the overlaps are and where the opportunities are to um, integrate the brand or the message of the organization that the marketing teams worked really hard on, um, but into the fundraising messaging so that you're talking one thing, you know, that you're saying mm -hmm. the same thing across the board, but it's really that planning piece in the middle where, you know, both sides are informed about what you're doing. Let me turn to the audience again, too. Do any of you have that in your organizations? Do you have the opportunity to have your marketing and your development sit down and talk about what needs to be communicated? I see a couple of heads nodding. That's great. Do any of you not have that and wish that you did? <laughs> There's heads okay. nodding. I know. Something that we do in our organization is each Monday we have a quick, brief 15 minute meeting and said, all right, this is what my department's working on this week. You know, these are my struggles. Where can you know you guys help me out this week? And we purposely keep it no more than 15 minutes because we don't want it to drag on as other staff mm -hmm. meetings. But it's purely is this is what I'm doing. What are you guys doing this week? How can mm -hmm. we work together? Mm -hmm. And I, you know, having been in marketing for 30 plus years, that is whether you're for profit or non profit in a recession. That's the number one place that gets cut first. Sure. It, it, it is, and I might be biased because of my experience, but I think what I'm hearing from you three is to say. It is, it is a fundamental support piece to your development plan, oh, to absolutely. your fundraising efforts. How can you convince or how do you make the case for that with, with senior staff or perhaps with boards or whatnot when you're coming into that budget time to say, hey, but this is what we're doing to help the fundraising piece. How do you have that conversation? Or what should you say? If you don't have the tools and the resources, you're not gonna be successful. You now, as we heard from Penelope, that you need to have the most fundraising, the byproducts are talent and time. And if you're not putting in that talent and time from your communications, then you're not gonna be successful. And just for our online audience really quickly, Penelope's last name. Penelope Burke. Burke was the plenary this yes, morning. Yes, she was open, our opening on uh, Sunday. Yesterday. yesterday. At the conference, yes. so that's who he was referring. There's no Penelope on this set right now. But, <laughs> yeah. Were you gonna say something? Um, I was just gonna say that you, know, you said something about, you know, creating your case and from a marketing perspective in a, in a for-profit environment and the fundraising side, you know, creating that case statement or case for support really is that message that turns into your marketing um, communications tool for you to push out to your audiences. But I also think that um, even without resources, um, you can still be successful at marketing yourself as an organization and to your donors, but you just have to kind of tweak how you get there. Um, it's using things smarter and, um, and really looking at budget and resources and tying them in together. I would add, with the making the case for resources, so many times we cut that, and then when a donor says to us, the only time I ever hear from you is when you're asking for money, Ooh. they're right, because we've done something to our budgets and cut all of the communications, our chances to say thank you and here are the lives that you're changing and here's how you're making a difference and we're making a difference. And, but we think we can keep asking them for money even though we haven't been reporting back to them and it just won't work. You know, you, these two in creating the fundraising success series, you both talk about having committees, a marketing committee and a fundraising committee. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking of the opportunity to cross pollinate those. Sure. So how could you do that for the benefit of marketing and how could you do that for the benefit of fundraising? Well, I think you're talking about board committees, having yeah, board, board members and volunteers, volunteers working on that. Mm -hmm. One way is to have marketing and communications professionals outside of your organization volunteer on the development committee so that you're crossing that way. And, and getting versa. their expert advice. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we think of those committees and we think of those committees only from that perspective of if it's a fundraising committee, I just need fundraisers or people in development. Mm -hmm. But if you do have the opportunity and you're somebody on your board, and yes, maybe he is already or she is already on your marketing committee, if they could be working with that as well, then you've got kind of an ambassador between the two. Right, and it, it serves a couple of purposes. This morning's speaker was Karen Osborne and she talked about how engagement of a, of a donor and a board member increases how long they last with an organization and how much they give and asking a marketing professional to help you is allowing them to use their professional expertise, thus increasing their engagement and hopefully increasing their retention with the organization. Which point, and it's something that we're gonna to have to take a break, Okay. but I wanna talk about that when we come back, which we'll be looking at the fundraising cycle in marketing. So we'll be right back after this break. 
Do you feel like you're on a hamster wheel of fundraising activities, trying to meet a goal that's always just out of reach? Then join us in Fundraising Success, the Complete Development Plan, a discussion-style course designed for both brand new fundraisers and experienced professionals to help you create a development plan to increase your fundraising results. Select the fundraising activities that actually work for your organization. Set achievable financial goals and meaningful strategic goals. Create a useful timeline of fundraising activities and much more. If you're ready to create your complete development plan using resources you can use again and again to modify your plan annually, then enroll today and we'll see you in class. Enroll today at thephilanthropyshow.com. Welcome back to The Philanthropy Show. We are live in Orlando at ASP Florida's Planet Philanthropy with a fantastic audience for this session where we're talking about marketing your organization with purpose, with the dollar signs there, bringing that marketing and development uh, concepts together to forward your organization. So in this segment, I really kind of, I want to look at, Sarah, you had talked a little bit about how, you know, if, if your marketing budget is cut, Mm -hmm. then you can't really say thank you. And the donors may say, well, the only time I ever hear from you is da 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 da. But there are a number of marketing opportunities throughout the year, and I really want to look at some, some great ideas about how to drive your marketing with your fundraising cycle and what that can look like. So first off, how I know that you have to figure out, uh, from a marketer standpoint, I'm kind of giving away the secret here, your audiences, mm -hmm. but how would you determine those audiences that tie into your development plan? Well, the first step in the fundraising cycle is identifying prospects or prospective donors, identifying new donors, and, and that's your communication to the wider universe. But then you wanna cultivate them, and I think that's when you start making your, we would call it a case for support, making your case why a gift to us will change the world. Not necessarily what we're doing, and how we're gonna spend every dollar, but what the outcome will be. Along that cycle, mm -hmm. and along those along different audiences. Cycle. Well, and I think that once you determine who your prospects are from a fundraising perspective, then you segment down. You know, you're looking at who are people that fall into that major gift category, who are people that maybe would be better primed for, pl for planned giving, um, or et cetera. And so once you kind of work through that from a fundraising perspective, you're also then looking at what are the best ways to communicate with those audiences because not every single segment of donors needs the same type of communication and some may need more than others um, to continue to engage them. So kind of building that into how you think um, you need to communicate first and then figuring out what channels you're gonna use to actually reach them. Along those lines, once you've identified your targets, you've identified your channels, it's what's that message? Mm -hmm. You know, yes, we're asking for you to give a dollar to help build this shelter, but the way that I'm going to be selling that to a major donor or the way I'm selling it to a planned giving prospective donor is totally different. Mm -hmm. So you need to craft your message to your audience depending on the channel. Mm -hmm. Josh, mm -hmm. you mentioned in the last segment that it's very valuable when you have a clean database, and I think everybody would love to have a clean database, and most often we don't. It's just, it's one of those things that gets lost in the shuffle of busy nonprofit life. But how would you kind of classify those? Then you're talking about knowing what the different segments are, like Meryl, you talked about you've got your planned giving, and you've got your major gifts, and you can sometimes those overlap, and mm -hmm. what would you do from, just from that, I want to get a little technical on this, what would you do to, to separate that that could help track that so you know then who that group of people is. Well, depending on what database you're using, there are great products out there, so I'm not gonna mention any names because I don't wanna promote anyone, but it's internally, are you using tracking codes? Are you using a notes feature? Are you using moves management? Which, personally, I think is a very antiquated term. I think we can find a different way to take our donor and move them through the giving process, but it's really about the way that you initially put them in there and the way that you're tracking every single touch with them. Because once you're able to create that donor profile and that complete picture, you're able to determine, all right, well, what box are they falling into? Which message am I going to share with them through which channel? An example would be to use your database to look for a donor who's given to you 10 years in a row, hmm. or seven out of the last 10, doesn't matter the size of the gift, but those become your best planned giving prospects. We, we tend to think it's a person who's given us a lot of money would be a good planned giving prospect. That's not always the case. 
a loyal donor makes a good prospect. But if you never got the data in there well, or you're not recording every gift they're making, then it, it's hard to do. And I worked once in an organization that had um, at least 40 years of data, and I had a colleague who constantly complained about how hard it was to get information out of it. And I had come from a very small organization, and I swore I'm never going to complain about this because I'm looking at 30 or 40 years of gift history. Oh. Right. Oh. No matter how hard it is to get information out of there, I'm going to be grateful for that. I think but I it need all to have palpitations <laughs> on that. <laughs> it all starts like today with what we're putting in now and how we're taking care of that information. So thoughts on that because part of what I wanted to kind of o overview in this segment is how do you create a multifaceted marketing campaign that does mm -hmm. support that? If you haven't started before, that was a great idea. Go through and see who's actually given on an annual basis. What are some other things? How could you classify? Your, how could you group them up? Well, well from, a, from a major gifts perspective, you know, determining what is a major gift to your organization and segmenting people by the level that they've given. Um, you can also look at ways that people have given. So maybe you're looking at just your direct mail donors or just people that have given maybe through some e-communications if you've done that. Um, but really looking at how people have engaged with their giving to kind of better structure maybe what tools from a marketing perspective you use in order to communicate and connect with them. And chances are you may not even have that in your database. You may some, not. Some people, many organizations may not have had the time or the staff ability to say, well, this came in via this campaign. Right. But if you can start that, even if you can maybe do one or two or three things this year, you're, you're making a plan towards that multifaceted campaign. I think it's also looking at not necessarily the giving tool, but what the giving activity was. So mm -hmm. if it's a special event fundraising activity, that person might not be lined up to be a major gift, even though they might have the capacity, but you need to start seeing that historical data of, okay, well, they attended our gala this year, and then they gave her, you know, via our annual appeal, well, you know, let's start to see what other touches we can do to move them through the term that I don't like, but that, you know, the moves management uh, cycle. So, Meryl, take us through some of the, the standards. I know we've got, like, our e-newsletter. Mm -hmm. Pretty much everybody has an e-newsletter. A lot of organizations do events. Um, some people do direct mail, um, maybe a couple campaigns, maybe a lot. Um, some people do, you know, giving through social media or through their website. Um, and I think that one of the things, you know, that Josh was touching on is that if you're able to segment your your audience and you're able to look at, they're having a lot of fun over there. Yes, they um, are. If you're able to segment um, how people give and interact with you, then you can tailor the message to the best way that they'll listen. And you can also determine how hard you have to work with certain segments to move them through the fundraising cycle to get them to the next step, which then helps to define how you're talking to them from a marketing perspective and what you're asking them to do. Because it's all about engagement, it's all about relationships. Mm -hmm. And if we're not connecting with people on their level or in the way that they want, then we're not going to be able to productively move them forward. What I think is overlooked too are the touches with donors to simply inform and engage. Yes. We shouldn't always be, and whether it's sending a thank you or what, you know, it doesn't matter, but I shouldn't be always coming back to you and every time I'm meeting with you, it's saying, here's my handout. Mm -hmm. Right. I should be coming to you and say, hey, listen, because of your $10 gift last month, we were able to do X, Y, and Z. And you know what? This is what we have in the pipeline. We're so thankful for you being a supporter. I can't wait to see you next time. And leave it at that. You know, the, the dreaded FASC, that thanking ass, mm. is the absolute worst that you can do. <laughs> I love that. I, I'm not cloning that term. That's Lynn Wester's term, and <laughs> she's got it. FASC. FASC. Don't FASC me, man. Don't Absolutely me. not. Well, <laughs> Man, you just, I lost a thought based on that. I loved it. Mind blown. Mind blown. Um, Meryl, you talk about doing some types of A-B testing mm -hmm. or doing alternatives. And, and, you know, sometimes it's all we can do just to get a version, one version of our newsletter out or one version of an invite out. Mm -hmm. What are the benefits of, and how I'm could kind of you, yeah, testing. and how could you segment your audience? When would that be appropriate based on different types of donors. Well, I mean, you could do it, uh, probably an easy way to do it would be like with a some type of e-campaign, because it's something that's fairly easy to do and, and not, um, you know, very costly, but that you could create basically two messages, you know, along the same lines, you know, please donate for X amount of dollars, this is what we're trying to do, this is the impact it's going to create, and you slightly tweak it, whether it's the amount that you're asking or what you're telling them that it impacts, and send it to two segments of your audience to really see 
how people are, are reacting to that. You know, do you need to tweak how you're talking about impact? Do you need to ask them for a different amount of money? It's a, kind of a, a more simplistic way to kind of do the A-B mm -hmm. testing where you, you want to see, you know, well, we're communicating with people this way, but we don't really know if it's working. If we tweak it a little bit and they react this way, then we know this works or we know this doesn't work and then you can move forward or even even not from there. giving but maybe it's responding maybe it's clicking on a link maybe mm -hmm. it's you need volunteers maybe it's you want people to come to an event or to thank people but it's some way that you're you're creating some kind of call to action whether it's it's financial or it's time or resources that you can kind of gauge whether or not people are reacting can i add a caution sure. to what she's saying and and i want to emphasize meryl said a b testing that is not to put two versions of a letter in front of a board committee no. and ask them which one do you think would get more no. response because no. i think sometimes as oh. as fundraisers as professional development staff we're forced to run things past like a marketing communications department far away from our fundraising function in our nonprofit or board volunteers they're not the target audience and and no. that's not testing mm -hmm. that's proofreading so if you're going to test, really test, but don't let the people inside your organization dictate how you're communicating with your donors. Well, and it also shouldn't be something that's so far off the mark of what your organization represents or does that it doesn't make sense. I mean, we're talking about very, you know, slight tweaks right. in how you're talking to people or messaging something. Um, with the goal of seeing some kind of engagement. Correct. Or some kind of response. I think one of the most thank thankless things that you can do as a task of being a marketing and communications person is sending out your announcement or your newsletter or your, even your direct mail and then not having any idea whatsoever if anybody has seen it. And then how do you go back to your board and say I need this amount in my budget because you have no statistics, you have no data to support it, right? There's no metrics backing it up. But that's what I like about the AB and if you can think of even one thing that you could do through the year that you could use as an AB, test, to change it up just to say, okay, now let me go into my constant contact, or let me go into my MailChimp, and let me see which one had a higher response rate from what I was driving. That one thing might be enough to be able to influence how you communicate with your with your donors, which is what the goal is, is to get their attention. How do they listen to you? And, and what I've seen very effective from the A-B testing is, so you take your list, you segment it out with you know maybe 10 names here, 10 names there, same messaging, but it's that subject line. So one, you do like a, a soft call to action, and one is a hard, strong call to action, and based upon that, then you send it out to your entire list with whatever had the most reaction or the most mm -hmm. whatever you're trying to measure specifically. You just brought up something, Josh, that I'd actually forgotten I wanted to cover in the first segment, but let's go ahead and talk about it right now. And that is, you know, in, in relaying your organization's purpose, how many times or how important is it, I don't even know if you can put a time parameter on it, to share the main gist of your marketing initiative. In other words, the, de the development team has decided that they want to accomplish these three goals this year. They want this, they want this, and they want this. So how do you, as that marketing person, latch on to those goals to communicate that with the donor? Do you understand where I'm coming from? It's like, how do you, com how do you communicate that message so that you have intention, so that you're speaking the same thing all the way through your organization? So for me, it comes down to storytelling. And it's not about telling the, the global picture, but boiling it down to a single individual that's going to directly impact. Because it's much easier for us to look at someone's face and say, all right, this is who is going to be affected by us building a well. And by us building a well now, they're going to be able to get fresh, clean water, and they're not going to have to go through all these hardships in their lives. So I can think about it's much directly what this one little girl is going through versus saying, all right, we're going to build a well, and it's going to help this entire village. Mm -hmm. OK, that's great. I'm going to help 10,000 people in this village. But it's Salem's story and what Salem has to go through every day to get water for her family. Well, now it's going to be a lot easier. And you can make that personal connection with what Salem's going through. And you can tell that story. And then, and that can be the, the kind of the crux of what your marketing positioning is and your message as an organization. But then from the fundraising perspective, you know, adding on, you know, by contributing X amount of dollars, it does this. Here's where the impact is created with your contributions or your resources. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily creating a whole different message for the fundraising piece, but latching on to what the marketing messaging and kind of focus is for your organization and then really enhancing that with the fundraising piece. I think that would be a great exercise to look at the fundraising cycle and see how can I tell Salem's story from the introduction mm -hmm. phase. 
How can I tell it from the cultivation phase? How can I tell it from the solicitation phase? How can I tell it from the stewardship phase? Because it, like Meryl said, it's not gonna be a different story, but how you speak it might be a little bit different in who you're sending this, and that's, what, that's the goal of this, is to say, here's my marketing, here's my development, how can I merge these together to move that along, right, and go through it. Good stuff, you guys. Well, there's one element that we've just barely touched on, and that's social media. Mm. It's time to take a break, but next segment, we're gonna talk more about marketing your organization with purpose via social media. We'll be right back. How does a marketing and communications plan enhance your fundraising efforts? Is marketing really an essential part of development? And do you know what you want to say but don't know how to reach your intended audience? In Fundraising Success, creating an annual marketing and communications plan, you'll learn to harness the mission of your organization and truly communicate its impact. You'll learn to identify your marketing team and how to leverage their experience and resources. You'll learn to evaluate the success of your plan and identify areas for improvement and planning, and much, much more. Using HD video lectures and downloadable worksheets you can use year after year, you'll create an organic marketing plan that's tailored to your organization's specific needs. Join today and we'll see you in class. And welcome back to The Philanthropy Show, live from Orlando, AFP Florida's Planet Philanthropy 2016, and I think that's hashtag AFP16PP, yep. right? I get that right? You got it right. Yeah. yeah, Sarah and I have a little thing with that hashtag. It's a lot of fun. Who did that episode? Jimmy Fallon and Justin Timberlake. Yeah. His was it's funny. not original. If you job. haven't seen it, you have to watch hilarious. it. It's, it's hilarious. So this segment, we're looking at social media and how can you market with purpose through social media. Now, let's just talk about the elephant in the room briefly. We had a little hiccup this year, little nationwide hiccup on Give Day, and everybody knows about it, and we've pushed through. But some organizations actually did really, really well on Give Day. Some of them, mm, that platform that won't be named, didn't work so well, and that happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. So gently speaking, we still need to like take a look at social media. Now, Josh and I both teach social media, and that's one of those things of, this is the new way of communicating. This has changed the way we communicate. We talk about inbound, outbound marketing or engagement, my willingness to participate and receive your newsletter or your blog or to take part in it. How does social media work for nonprofits, and what role should it play within your marketing slash development planning? Josh, I'm gonna start with you. So, <clears throat> for me personally, I am under the belief that social media does not equal fundraising. Social media is a part of your communications plan. It can be a part of your fundraising plan, but, and we'll use Give Local America as a perfect example. In Palm Beach County, we had 504 nonprofits participating. We, had, we raised over $3 million, which was fabulous, but of those 504 nonprofits, if you're under the impression that, okay, I'm gonna put out a tweet on May 3rd, and that's the only communications that I've done the dollars are gonna roll in, and that's so wrong. It's a great way to engage, it's a great way to build loyalty and tell your story with the hopes of getting a donation, but it is not the underlying of what a fundraising plan is. Yes, we have crowdfunding, yes, we have the Obama $5 campaigns, and these are outliers, but when it comes down to it, social media is the way that you're telling your story. It is your brand, it is your voice, it is an opportunity for your supporters and potential supporters to engage with you at all times. You are never off. And we almost have to always be expected to communicate and engage no matter what time of day. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a conversation. Um, social media is a means to have a conversation with people in a place that they may not be accessing information otherwise. And so um, it is what Josh said. I mean, it's that opportunity to share, to engage, to tell your story. Um, to talk about impact, to um, offer ways for people to get more involved with what you do and, and what the organization provides in the community, but it is not the answer to fundraising. Mm. It is a tool in fundraising. Um, if you are engaging people properly... That was a tweetable moment. <laughs> it is not the answer to fundraising. It is a tool for fundraising. And I think that it's, you know, what we forget a lot of times, and I know that 
resources from a nonprofit's perspective are sometimes slim, and you don't have a dedicated person posting stuff on social media. But you have to think about it from a longevity standpoint. It's not about necessarily how often you're on it, but that you're consistent with it. Mm -hmm. And so if you can be consistent with however you're using social media to engage people in a conversation, it's a way to engage them further so that when you're ready to ask, that they will give. Um, but it can't be used you know, as a kind of one-shot wonder where you're, you're going online and asking people to donate uh, money and hoping that thousands of dollars are gonna come in unless you've engaged people to the point that they're ready to be asked that way. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they will. The, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And I've been fundraising for a really long time, back when we had to use the telephone and, Candles? and stamps. No. <laughs> we had electricity. But yes, even strange. back then, we talked about you can't every conversation be asking for money. I mean, if every time we called a donor or sent them a letter were to ask them for money, mm -hmm. we wouldn't build a relationship. I think social media has uh, magnified that. We, we've got to be engaging with them on some other kind of content. Otherwise, we're, we sound like, will you give us money? Will you mm -hmm. give us money? Will you give us money? And, and it's so easy now for people to just turn us off. And when you look at who your audiences are, thank you. <laughs> you need to know what channels are best to reach those audiences. Yes. And I just because thing. you have so many options out there and there's almost a new platform or a new way to communicate happening on a weekly, daily basis, if you will, that doesn't mean that your organization needs to invest their time and resources in it. I always believe it's best to do one or two, maybe three really well, and leave it at that. Mm -hmm. If you are a visual organization, that you've got a great story to tell, be on Instagram. You know, if you're very technical and reaching out to a medical professional world, I think LinkedIn has a good audience for that. You know, Facebook is what's happening, Twitter's what's happening now. It's live, it's real, and it's in the moment. So if you have that type of content to share, know which way is gonna be the most effective for your messaging. One of the most common questions or most frequently asked questions that I get is, what's the point of the hashtag? But it's just like we said at the beginning of this segment, hashtag AFP16PP. That's the hashtag for this conference. And the reason that hashtags exist is what Merrill said moments ago, to be included in the conversation. So it gives you the opportunity to look up and see what everybody else's experiences are at this conference. It unifies the conference goers here and creates uh, like a chat room almost where you can, you can talk with each other and, and pulls you all together. So the other big point that, of talking about your audiences, just as a quick example, when I was working at the Community Foundation, I realized we had three audiences. And you know Community Foundations grant money to local nonprofits. It's not their money, it's money that philanthropists in the community have given as endowments to give to a specific cause or an interest or an organization, whatever. Well, there are the three different types of audiences are obviously the nonprofits who are the grant recipients. Then you also have the philanthropists, the donors who are giving that money. And then finally you have the professional advisors, maybe they're CPAs or financial advisors or whatnot who are advising those philanthropists who are giving the money. Now, let's think about that. The donors who are average age 75, 80 were not on LinkedIn, they were not on Facebook, they were not on Twitter. They might read email, maybe, but generally they like to receive mailings, right? Just envelopes and whatnot, or a phone call. Wow, we forgot about the power of the phone. The professional advisors, where do you think they were? Guesses? Email, offices, but Think of a social media? LinkedIn. LinkedIn. They were on LinkedIn. Many of them were on LinkedIn. And then where do you think the nonprofits were from a social media standpoint? Facebook. 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 Exactly. So we had the three mediums were direct mail slash phone calls or in-person visits, Facebook for nonprofits, and then LinkedIn for the professional advisors to be able to communicate to them and to then drive that through, like Sarah, I love the, the fundraising cycle as she talks about. So when you're using your social media, and as Josh said, it's not to necessarily put it out there and say, hey, can you give me some money? But it's also, again, following, which many of you in this room are CFREs, that fundraising cycle. You're using social media for the same thing. You're trying to engage them, get them in the conversation. What are some examples, or can you think of things that are necessary to use in social media to communicate with your donors or with those that you're trying to reach out to? So since 
the human's average attention span now is less than a goldfish. It's actually, <laughs> eight, it's true. Average attention span of a goldfish is nine seconds. The human is 8.25. And where, my God, did you see that? No, it's just, it's, study. it's, it's sad that really? I've come across. Really? pulled it out. Somebody sadly, Wikipedia that. I want to know for sure. It's the truth. Sadly, 15 <laughs> years ago, so going back to 2000, the average attention span for a human was 12 seconds. So it's because of social oh, media, damn. it's because of always having that smartphone in our pocket and wow. always having the ability to answer any question we always want, our attention spans have gone down. So our communication to them has to be quick, to the point, and visual. That's just the way that we process information. So you want to make sure that you have good visuals, whether you're using stock images that don't look like stock images, or you're using tools to create your, your graphics, and there's some great ones out there. I'll plug Canva. I think Canva for nonprofits is underutilized. Canva for nonprofits will allow you to upload your color uh, palette. You can use specific fonts. That way, you, when you come every time, your, your content for your visual graphics that you're creating look consistent. Mm -hmm. So you've got your tweet that's going to be 120-ish characters, but now actually Twitter's changing, and they're doing away with the pictures and the links, so now that's not going to count towards they're your... They're not counting it towards your overall. Right, that yeah. counts to your 140 characters, and they say that's going to roll out any day now. So it's how are you going to visually pull me in, capture me with a, a message that's got the hook, and use a either branded hashtag, so I know it's about your organization or your cause, or it's a hashtag that's part of a larger conversation. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I think is important to include is a way to, to ask people a question or to ask them something, some kind of call to action to get them to respond, and then we need to be quiet and listen. Um, because mm -hmm. I think that a lot of times we are constantly pushing things out but we're not necessarily asking for a response, and in the only way that we're gonna know whether or not we're doing what we're doing is um, in the best way possible is by listening mm -hmm. so that we can tweak what we're doing and move forward with a different strategy if we need to. I want to emphasize that none of these three said that you cannot use social media to raise money online. But they said right. it's not the sole, it's not the main purpose of it. It leads to it. So what, are, what is a way or a couple of ways that have worked in online donations and using social media? So we'll, I'll come back to Give Local America. Uh, May 3rd, everything was going great in Palm Beach County. It's 9.30 a.m. We've raised half a million dollars. We're getting around to 11 o'clock. We're well ahead of where we've been the past two years. We've raised over a million dollars. And then everything goes yeah. down. Not just locally, but nationally. And mm -hmm. things started to, to go sour. So we use social media as a way to immediately reach out there. We could have sent an email, or we could have you know, picked up the phone call. But we used Facebook Live to go live at the Community Foundation. We had our community uh, representative from the Community Foundation, our marketing director, get on camera and say, you know, we know what's going on. Philanthropy broke the internet. You know, it's unfortunate. <laughs> uh, but we were smart because we set up an, an 800 number or an 844 number three years ago, 844 Give Day. So we said, listen, you saw the opportunity to give. Make sure you let your supporters know. And that one piece of content was shared countless times by awesome. the various nonprofits. So. Using technology, using social media, it allows all of us to now tell our story live at any time. So we're really reporters. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at it as, okay, I'm a production studio at any time, where can I tell my story and how can I do that most effectively using social media to our advantage? That's excellent. I love that example. Yeah, that's a great one. It's yeah. beautiful. Well, I learned something from one of our production assistants. Bryn Warner teaches a class in the Tampa area, and he talked about using LinkedIn to find people with specific skills or specific interest areas. So if you're putting on a golf tournament, you can you can use that as a or filter based mm -hmm. on golf or filter based on professions. And, and you've got people in the universe of your organization who have things to offer that you never think to look for. Awesome. So, and speaking you. of Bryn, Bryn, would you stand up and come stand by camera too? So, we're going to wrap up this segment, and Bryn then is going to be in charge of our audience Q&A, and we'll move into that segment now. So thank you for being with us here today on The Philanthropy Show. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. How do you engage and empower your board in the fundraising and development process? How do you know if your board has the right mix or is ready to enter the process? In Fundraising Success, Board Engagement and Empowerment in the Fundraising Process, you will learn 
basic board roles and legal responsibilities of board members, how to discover your board's culture and play to its strengths, the right ways to educate and motivate your board in development, how to recruit board members who are skilled in fundraising, and much more. Using HD video lectures and downloadable resource documents you can use year after year, this course will quickly become your go-to guide for understanding how to educate, engage, and empower your board to become a fundamental support in your organization's fundraising process. Join today and we'll see you in class. Welcome back to the Philanthropy Show, live from sunny Orlando, Florida, with the hashtag AFP16PP, that is AFP Florida's Planet Philanthropy for 2016. And what we're going to do right now is turn it over to our studio audience. Uh, Bryn, I think you have a couple people, and if you would say your name, where you're from, and then ask your, your question. My name is Suzanne Ruley, and I work for RCS, Religious Community Services in Clearwater, Florida. And my question is, is we're um, working on budgeting for next year, and we're trying to figure out what to do with our communications budget. It seems like with so many ways of communicating, everything from um, Facebook, Twitter, traditional print, and the fact that uh, so many people are not purchasing newspapers, that they're going online and they're also getting their own personal editions, mm -hmm. or finding their messaging, um, their information from specific sites. How, how do you plan for that? How do you figure out how to communicate when uh, it's so diverse and so personalized to the individual? That's a great question. So for me, if I have any dollars that I can invest and I'm probably different than a lot, I don't want to print anything. I think that anytime I print something, it's going to be out of date within six weeks, if that. I'm going to print way more than I need to actually send out. So invest in good graphics. So if you don't have a good graphic designer in-house, spend money on that. And then if you have any dollars whatsoever in terms of advertising, Facebook ads. 100% the greatest ROI that you can, the measurable, can actually reach a target so specific to who you exactly want your message to get out to. Okay, I'll buy a radio ad and it's gonna get out to 20,000 people, but only 200 of those people do I actually wanna reach out to. Using Facebook ads, I can find those 200 people that I can get my message in front of to, as you say, be as specific and personalized as possible. You can run campaigns for five, ten dollars or five, ten thousand dollars Josh, let me do a follow-up. Don't go away yet, Suzanne. So. Do, does Nonprofits First teach Facebook ads? We have courses in... Do you have yeah. online courses? Do you have that available? We are working on adding that. But we do offer webinars, so that is something that we could offer okay. through a webinar. Okay, I want you guys okay. to connect, because there are a lot of regions in Florida who have no access to a nonprofit center, since there's only six MSOs in Florida, and they may not have Facebook ads as one of their courses. Mm -hmm. So you, I, I, would, I would say learn it, before you put it into your budget because yes. you could spend a lot of money that he can help you focus that money on. And also along those lines, every nonprofit in this room basically could qualify for Google AdWords. If you're not aware, Google gives up to $10,000 a month per nonprofit for free advertising. Uh, keep in mind the max cost per click bid is $2. So if you have a very general term, you know, iPhone, well obviously your cost per click bid is not going to be anywhere near where that $2 max is going to get you. So, you know, figure out what your niche is, how you can reach that, and then take advantage of Google AdWords is $10,000 a month. And if you reach that, you have the potential to actually get up to $40,000 a month in free Google AdWords advertising. That's the, about Google Ads. Now, Suzanne, if your audience is not on Facebook, don't go to Facebook. So you, you really need to know where your audience is well, first. And I was going to add that there's a differentiation, I guess, from a marketing perspective and fundraising of you know, are, do you have a specific targeted audiences that you're trying to reach and ask for something versus uh, educating the community broadly about what your organization does? And so things like what Josh is mentioning are great for targeted campaigns because you can measure that and you can see <coughs> what the return is. Um, but if you're looking to educate the general public about what you're doing, then traditional things like, you know, print or radio, you know, billboards, things like that, which a lot of those companies will work with you with donated space or public service announcements um, that won't necessarily cost you money to do, um, you know, can be utilized. So I think you have to think about what's targeted versus what's broad. And then, you know, I would say too, if you're stuck with a specific amount, you know, where you can't go further then, then you just have to 
use the money in the best, most powerful way that you can instead of trying to do everything. Like Josh said earlier, pick the things, a few things that you can be really good at and excel at in connecting with people and then add as you go. Thank you. You're welcome. I love the thing about it. Come, have the next person come up, the, the Facebook ads though. Mm -hmm. Very effective. Great. Yeah. Yes. Hello, I'm Alice Lee Stansbury and the president of Stansbury Consulting. And I'm a big advocate for marketing and social media. Uh, and I have a lot of clients who get it. They realize the value of uh, branding their organization, getting their messaging out, uh, targeting their audiences, all that kind of stuff, uh, and how important it is in fundraising. The problem is that then when the budgets are being developed mm -hmm. and boards are approving budgets, sure. Uh, they, they, they're having trouble getting, um, sometimes it's the CEO, but oftentimes it's the board or maybe even the marketing chair on the board who says, well, you know, we ought to be able to get this stuff for free. And, you know, how, <laughs> what advice do you all have as seasoned folks in this um, to help nonprofits go back to their shops, go back to the powers that be, and get the support they need in within the organization to be investing in this. So I would take 18 minutes, pull up on your screen a TED Talk by Dan Pilata. Yes. And explain to them, and Dan will do a very good job in this TED Talk, that we have to invest in ourselves if we want as a nonprofit sector here, to be here. successful. Amen. Yay, so, we gotta get some clapping on that. Right. Yes, it's, it's wonderful to get things for free, but sometimes we need to pay for what we want to achieve through our goals. So 100% sit down with them and say, listen, this is the TED Talk you need to watch. Well, the irony, of course, is that board members represent their own businesses, mm -hmm. and so they make those decisions all the time, but then when they come to the board table, they seem to leave that at the door and forget that it's, it's, a, it's a part of doing business. So, a lot so of the board any members, other tips? Since they're from the for-profit side, um, you got to kind of tweak the language a little bit, but it's really about return on investment. They're all making decisions in their for-profit businesses that are all about what is the return on the investment that I give? If I, if I put $50,000 into this, what am I gonna get out of it? Right. It's the same thing on the nonprofit side. So maybe it's kind of turning the tables a little bit on how the, how the conversation is going to help them understand that it is, it is the same direct relationship when it comes to the nonprofit. And the great thing about social media is that you can see you what can that return is. You can track yeah. it. Mm -hmm. right. So it's not like you know, you're know you putting a radio campaign out there and you don't know if people are actually calling you or going to your website or right. where they're coming from. Right. You know, This is very specific. So I think that may help a little bit in yeah. the conversation. Um, the other thing that I've seen work is that if on the development, the resource development team, there is somebody that's maybe an outside marketing professional that is good at doing social media or is a consultant, um, having them have a voice in part of that conversation too, because then there's internal buy-in on the board level and internal. Well, you know what happens? You're never a profit in your own land. I know. So <laughs> having that, ex yeah. Yeah, that external person. Yeah. yeah. I think tracking uh, metrics is also a really good suggestion. Yeah, Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I heard uh, as part of the fundraising success series, there was another version, part three, board engagement and empowerment in your fundraising process. And Liz Wooten Rescue talks about that problem, about how board members are, uh, many of them are corporate employees, and that they are working towards the ROI of their company, and they know how to make those best profitable decisions. But then for some reason what happens when they come over to a nonprofit, mm -hmm. it's that lack mentality that Dan Pilata says, let's push that aside. And one of the ways she said to encourage them for that, and so those of you who are connected with your senior staff or if you are senior staff and have this kind of thinking, that the board member doesn't have to see you as the nonprofit without, but that you are an organization making incredible change in your community and that you're actually being able to, your ROI, is being able to show how much this investment is helping make that change in the community. So you just have to focus on the other side, and we might have to do it for another couple of years mm -hmm. before that kind of thinking changes, but that makes a lot of sense. Do we have another question? All right. Hi, I'm Katherine Brown. I'm with Seniors First right here in Orlando. Uh, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year, and we just did a total rebrand, new website, new logo. Everything is very exciting. Big year. Um, yes, it was. We, um, we did all the press releases. We did the social media posts. We did a launch party for our donors and our volunteers and our board. How do, do you have any suggestions on how to keep that momentum going? Because 
prior to this whole rebrand, I, I discovered nobody would really paid much attention at all to the website, to social media. I mean, it was all cobwebby. So I've been trying to get it up off the ground. How can I keep that kind of interest going? So I would identify half a dozen or so dozen of your clients and tell their story on a weekly basis. How are they directly benefiting from what you're doing? So it's, you know, you know on every Monday you're going to get the story of Jim. And Jim has been a service, you know, taking advantage of your services for the past 15 years through your various in-home meal services or coming to do group therapy sessions. Well, why do you guys make his life better? So tell me the story of Jim. Tell me the story of Alice. Tell me the story of Bryn. What am I going to learn about them over the last 50 years that they've now been able to benefit from you? So, and just change it up every week. Absolutely. So or, or take one person and tell their story across the year. So you've got like six stories that you're going to tell from their perspective for the next 52 weeks. Very interesting. Thank oh, you. That's cool. Thank you. Well, you're, on a, you're just sitting on top of the world right now because you've got all this energy around this 50th and all the rebrand and all that. And if you can just keep that going, and she's in the position of not necessarily having to work, worry about her marketing budget getting cut because everybody's like, oh, well, that's just what it is. Yeah, that's right. Yay. Do we have another question? All right, now we're going to go to wrapping up the show, and this is where we ask our signature question, which is, what is your heart's definition of philanthropy? Everybody in the nonprofit community has a reason for being here. So the philanthropy show in specific, anytime we have guests on our show, we like to ask that of our guests. Now, this can be a definition. It can be an example, a story, anything that's uh, around a two-minute reply. But why do you do what you do? Josh, let's start with you. So I was born with a congenital heart defect. I uh, serv uh, received services from All Children's Hospital in St. Pete from when I was one day old and was very obviously grateful for the life that I have now. I've had two open heart surgeries and you wouldn't think that at 35 years old, what I've gone through, but know that I appreciate every moment that I have. So I've been in nonprofits my entire professional career uh, from frontline now into the <laughs> fundraising world and now into communications and know that the importance of giving back, that that donor who gave $10 helped advance the research in the medical device that I have in my chest. Wow. And it's you know simple to connect my story and see how I've progressed because of what their $10 donation did. So I give back because I've been a direct recipient of That's very cool. Yay. Love that. <laughs> Sarah. Well, because we're at AFP's Planet Philanthropy, I certainly have the profession, it's Association of Fundraising Professionals. I have that on my mind and I've been a fundraiser for a very long time. Now in my role as a consultant, I get to work with fundraisers and with organizations and I think our profession is so important because when it's done poorly, it impacts the entire community. Wow. If someone is raising money unethically, improperly, illegally, then it's bad for everyone. But then I come to something like Planet Philanthropy or I go to our local AFP chapter meetings and I'm surrounded by people who are doing it the very best ways and trying their hardest to make the most impact. Mm -hmm. And I get re-energized about our profession. We are a profession. We have a body of knowledge. We know what we're doing and we're changing the world every day. It's fabulous. And Sarah is the incoming president I'm of the, the president-elect of, president of, of the Sun Coast chapter of AFP. So thank you. Nicely done, Sarah. <laughs> Miss Merrill, what is your heart's definition? What you know, do you do? What I do? think um, it's something that was instilled in me at a very young age. Um, my parents were always giving back. Um, I, they, you know, we took Christmas presents, birthday presents, all those things, and, and gave them to people that needed mo them more than we did. Um, and we were always around a culture of people that, that were helping others. And so I think what I've learned over the years and something that I hold true in my heart about philanthropy is that if you have talents and things that can help change other people and change the way the community um, functions or um, make things better that you know you're given those for a reason mm -hmm. and so um, I really just enjoy you know working with nonprofits um, and and helping them realize what their potential is and and helping them kind of fix some of the things along the way so that they can do their work the best that they can in the community and and make it better for all of us Wow 
Yay, thank you. <laughs> so I want to say a quick thank you to our studio audience for being so fabulous, and, and not just because you're in the audience, but because you're here, and because you do what you do every day. Because there are not a lot of times when you get to hear thank you. You're always thanking your clients, or you're thanking your donors, or you're thanking your co-staff, but we want to thank you for everything that you do and for working towards that positive change within your communities. It is a life commitment. And there are a lot of things that when you work in the nonprofit community, you know, we don't necessarily have, although I love Dan Pallotta and I'm gonna follow that flag. Let's, let's do it the right way. So this is going to wrap up today's edition of The Philanthropy Show. We will have this online within the next week or so. Make sure you watch it. I want to thank you, our online audience, for joining us as well. And in the meantime, from Orlando, Florida, we'd like to say thank you. Have a wonderful day and enjoy the rest of AFP Florida Planet Philanthropy 2016. Bye, everybody.